Um, go with me in your Bibles to the book. Um, go with me and let's look at um, uh, Psalms 1. Let's go to Psalms 1. The blood of Jesus never loses its power. How many of y'all know that my inspirational song of today is Smoky Norfolk? The blood it never loses its power. Come on, let's pray. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you. We give you glory. We give you praise. We thank you for your word that is truth and not error. We thank you that the hear of your word will become a doer and that our lives will never, ever be the same. We give you all the praise, all the glory for all that should be accomplished and for all that should be revealed. In Jesus' name, somebody shout amen. Let's raise our Bibles and give our confession of faith. Say it like you mean it. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I am a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better. After having heard the word of faith, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. Psalms 1, verse number 1 is our foundational text. It says, Blessed is the man that not walking in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, um, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law do he meditate day and night. He should be like a tree by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also should not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the the shaft which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly should not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly um, shall perish. I've been talking to you about God the healer and I want to continue in that same vein of teaching and I have switched and moved from now dealing with physical healing to showing you how it is the will of God for those who are struggling mentally and emotionally and psychologically to walk in divine health in that area as well. The devil attacks in all types of areas. He does not just attack the physical body, but he attacks the mind. Romans 12, verse number one, quick review. Then I have to move into the information that I have for you today. Romans 12, verse number one says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye trained transformed by the renewing of our minds. So God want us to renew our minds when we come into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. God now want the born again believer to work on the renewing of the mind. Now go to 3 John 2 because 3 John 2 shows us where God want us to prosper mind, body, and soul. Not everybody is dealing with health issues. Not everybody is dealing with, you know, cancer and heart issues and, and diabetic issues. Some folks are dealing with mental assaults from the enemy and God is a deliverer as well as a healer. All right. Third John two says, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. So yesterday we talked about how the enemy attacks the mind. And we said the enemy has three primary weapons. Go to Ephesians six, verse number 12, three primary weapons that he used to attack the believer in their mind mind in their way of thinking. Ephesians 6 verse number 12, you've read this scripture before and um, you should be very familiar with it. Verse number 12, it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Let's go to verse number 10. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers, the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Places. Wherefore, watch what it says, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Check that out now. See, Jesus, the Bible warns us of an evil day and having done all to stand, stand having your loins girt about with truth. That's the word of God. Having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, take the shield of faith where will you be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So the wicked man Man, the wicked, the evil spirit, he shoots these fiery darts and these fiery darts are shot at the believer to get the believer out of the will of God in the mind. He got to try to beat you in your thinking. The devil constantly 
constantly works to beat the believer down in the framework of their mind. All right, so now we said that spiritual warfare comes in two ways. Remember on yesterday, I talked about offensive and defensive. Offensive warfare is tearing down strongholds that the enemy um, uses on your thought life, and he uses deception and accusations. What is offense? Warfare. It's tearing down strongholds that the enemy um, uses on your mind. These strongholds can be strongholds that has attached themselves to you mentally uh, from past hurts, past pains, you know, past struggles. All of these things can affect your mental capacity, how you deal with life from a mental place. And then we said there's defensive warfare. It's guarding yourself against the tactics of are schemes of the devil. The devil have all types of schemes, all types of tactics, all types of stuff that he uses now to work overtime to beat down your resistance to the things of God. That's what he does. Remember now, I talked about how you got to be very careful how you deal with people who are, you know, as I call spiritual hoarders. If you ever watch that show Hoarder, you know, people pile up stuff and they keep stuff for years and for years and they get comfortable with it. And, and, and they know that they have an issue, but until they get help now, they can live amongst all that is filth and all of this, you know, dirt and all of these, you know, roaches and rats and all of this stuff comfortably because they are hoarders. But if you really deal with a hoarder and get to the root of the issue, there's something wrong mentally with this individual. And now remember I said now, you could be dressed up because a lot of hoarders now, they go to work every day. Come on somebody. They dress up and they, they, they go and work in industry and people don't know that they're hoarders. People don't know that they have all of this junk working in their homes and, and then when they go home, it's like they go and lay amongst all this junk and they act like nothing is wrong. Well, there's a bunch of church folks who are hoarders. You're hoarding things in your mind and it's a bunch of junk that's keeping you from experiencing God's best in life. Some past hurts, some past mistakes, some things that may have happened to you and let's not belittle things that happen to us. N let's not belittle that some folks have been molested and that molestation has caused them to have a mental complex you know that's totally contrary to the will of God for their life. We're not belittling the things that happens to people. We're not belittling sexual abuse and, you know, mental abuse and emotional abuse. We're not belittling those things, but we cannot hoard those things because as long as we hoard them, the devil will use those things against us and we will never experience the fullness of who God is. So the weapon, you know, of the belt of truth guard us against the deception of the devil, the, the, the weapon of truth. That is why when I get girded up and I put on my armor, I got to make sure that I put on all the armor. Here's the issue with a lot of church folks. We don't like to wear all of our armor. We put some armor on, we leave some armor off. And whatever part that you leave off, that's the part that the enemy is going to attack. If you leave off truth, he's going to bring in deception. Come on, somebody. If you leave off the helmet, he's going to shoot fiery darts. You got to make sure now that you wear your armor every day. You would leave your house half naked. Come on, somebody. Leave your house half naked and see what's going to happen to you. This ain't these cities where you can walk around with nothing on. Leave your house. Go into the grocery store and don't have on all your clothes and watch what happens to you. Well, the same in the spirit realm. If you leave your house, if you leave, you know, the environment that you are part of, if you don't have all of your armor on, the place that you failed to gird up will be. So watch this now. Now we comes in, that the enemy comes in and he try to wear you down. Whatever armor that you don't put on will be the place the devil penetrate. Somebody shout, put all your armor on. So now go with me in your Bible and let's look at some more stuff because the weapon of the sword of the spirit, the word of God, it tears down strongholds um, that 
took hold of my mind. Y'all come on back. Come on back. Come on back. I don't know what happened. Praise the Lord. But God is good anyhow. So what? Watch this now. When we talk about tearing down strongholds, the only way we can tear down strongholds is with the word of God. That's why he do not want you um, to engage this word. All right. Go to Joshua real quick. Joshua 1 verse number 8. Joshua 1 verse number 8. Somebody shout hallelujah. Just like the devil trying to steal somebody's message. All right. Joshua 1 1 verse number 8. Watch what it says about meditating on the word. All right. It says Joshua 1. Go to Joshua, Pastor. 1 verse number 8. All right. This book of the law should not depart out of thy mouth, but thou should meditate therein day and night. So if we're going to beat the enemy in our mind, we have to meditate on the word day and night. Day and night. Remember I talked about when I was in my um, when I had my cancer challenge how the enemy was constantly you know shooting me all these fiery darts and some of them came to through prognosis and diagnosis, which I couldn't be mad at the doctor because they was only reporting what they saw, you know, um, in the blood work. But how many of y'all know that there's another blood, come on somebody, in the blood of Jesus, it has the power to cleanse one consciousness. Watch what it says. This book of the law should not uh, depart out of thy mouth, but thou should meditate day and night. Thou, thou may observe to do according to all that is written therein, and then thou will make thy way prosperous, and then thou shall have... Come on, somebody, good success. So God says that he wants us to have good success. If you take one of those the one of those O's out, he wants us to have God's success. So now let's deal with these deceptions of the enemy to deceive somebody. That deception means to deceive somebody, to make another person believe a lie or something that is not true. That's what his deception is. Um, what are the two weapons um, to deal with deception? The first weapon that we must use to deal with deception is the better truth. When they was telling me how sick I was, I told them how healed I was. Come on, somebody shout amen. The weapon of the sword of the spirit, the word of God, it tears down existing strongholds that took hold of your mind. If I'm going to tear down strongholds, I got to tear them down with the word of God. Because when I tear these strongholds down, what the enemy cannot do now, he cannot steal what is sown in my heart. That's why the scripture says that we have to guard our hearts because what the enemy does, he comes immediately to steal that which was sown. If I had not, you know, had 20 plus years of in the word of God, then I probably wouldn't be sitting before you right now. I had the word of God, you know, in my mind, I was built on the word. I was built on the solid foundation. That's why the devil couldn't kill me. Because as long as my mind was strong, it was difficult for him um, to kill me physically. Yes, I was going through a physical attack. And yes, my body was, you know, being affected by the medicine and the chemo and the lack of exercise and the lack of food and the lack of everything. But my mind was still strong. Come on, somebody. And because my mind was still strong, I was able to walk away from a situation that could have possibly killed me. Somebody ought to shout amen. So now let's look at these two things, these two weapons to deal with. Let's look at temptation often follows deception. What the devil does is he tempt, he, he has deception then he brings about temptation. Come on somebody. For the enemy tells you um, that you are going to truly die. That's what he told Jesus. Jesus you're going to die. Come on somebody. Then he makes um, the fruit of the forbidden look good. So what deception does, deceptions tell you one thing, then after he deceived you, he present temptation. And if you're not strong in the Lord and the power of his might, that temptation would turn into an action. Come on now. It's, it's, it's not, it's, you're not going to live on this earth without having some level of temptation. I guess if you get a certain age, you know the devil figure, well, they don't have but about 10 years left. Ain't no use for tempting them. But for some of these young folks, you know what he does now, he brings deception and he said, that won't hurt you. Come on now, that won't kill you. 
um, that won't affect you. And then after he see that you have been deceived, he brings and he presents temptation. He presents something um, that will cause you now um, to respond in a negative way. Have you ever thought you was free from something and you had declared you was free, but then here come the enemy trying to tempt you with the thing that you declared you was free of? Because what the devil likes to do is try to wear you down emotionally. Emotionally. That is why you got to stay on your game. That's why you got to stay in your word. When he told Joshua to meditate on that word, he meant to ponder on that word. I cannot die from a sickness and disease if I ponder on healing scriptures. That's why when you're going through health challenges, you need to be infused in your thought life with scripture, with the word, building your life on a solid foundation. Remember, he never promised us that things will always be good. As a matter of fact, Psalms 34, 19 says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord will deliver you out of them all. I said, but the Lord will deliver you out of them all. We will all go through some type of afflictions. There will always be something that will present itself to tempt us to get out the will of God. But when my mind is strong, come on somebody, and my mind has been infused with the word of God, it doesn't matter what the temptation look like, I'm not going to bite the forbidden fruit and cause myself to get out of God's will because I knew this day was going to come. We don't wait until all hell break loose before we start building ourselves up. We build ourselves up when all is well. Come on, somebody. So when all hell break loose, we have something to fight with. I talk to you and those of you who are in the golden triangle, you know how we used to do. The moment we found out that there was a storm in the Gulf of Mexico, we start preparing, nailing up when Windows, buying canned goods, buying Vienna sausages, which I never eat another one as long as I live, buying spam, which I would never touch another piece of spam as long as I live, because growing up in Port Arthur, living on the Gulf Coast, you bought spam, you bought Vienna sausage, you bought canned sardines, come on somebody, glory to God, I thank God that he delivered me from all that stuff, but my point is, we make sure now, that we are preparing for the storm. And when I get in this word, I'm preparing for the storm. I'm not just getting in this word to memorize and regurgitate scripture. I'm getting in this word because there's the possibility that I might have to go to war. I might have to go to war for my mind. Come on, somebody. I might have to go to war for my body. And I want to make sure that I'm prepared for it. I'm armored up. I got everything on that I need because what the devil do with these fiery darts, he try to bring your past up and remind you that you don't qualify to be healed. You don't qualify to be delivered. You don't qualify to be set free because of everything that you did in your past. Well, the devil is a liar. If that's the case, then I wouldn't be sitting in front of this camera right now. The Lord qualified us when Jesus shed his blood on Calvary. I am qualified because 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, Come on now. He's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Come on now. Behold, all things must become new. I'm not who I used to be. I don't act the way I used to act. I'm not the same person that was victimized, you know, because of ignorance. Now I know the word of God. I don't have to succumb. I'm an overcomer. See, when you're prepared and when you have this word in you, you have enough ammunition now, come on now, to cast these thoughts down. I don't know if you remember, but I know Brother Ellis, he was in the military but in the first Gulf War, when they was over in Kuwait, that they were showing how, you know, the Kuwaiti army, they were shooting this missile over. And this missile was called a Scud missile, I believe. And that Scud missile was targeted for U.S. camps. But what they failed to realize was that the United States Army had a better missile called a Patriot missile. And they would shoot that missile and they would knock them Scuds down and they never hit their target. They never hit their mark. Well, that's the same way we are in the spirit realm. When the devil shoot us, come on now, you got to hear your boy this morning. When the devil shoot you these fiery darts, these are missiles to attack your mental capacity, to cause you, come on now, to diminish your ability um, to win in battles. And what he do now, he also, he tried to catch you while you're sleeping. That's why the Bible says be vigilant because the devil, he's like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Have you ever watched the animal 
planet and while you was watching the animal planet, the lioness who go to hunt for the food for the, for the animal tribe or for the lion's tribe, she go hunt and what she does, she wait for the wildebeest to cross the plane and she looks for the weakest one. Y'all not hearing me somebody. She locks in on the weakest one, the one that's not paying attention. The one that has stepped away, you know, from the pack. Come on now. When you're going through situations, when sickness has hit your body, when disease has infiltrated your mind, you got to hang with the right people. What the lioness do, she look for the weakest one. The one that's kind of, you know, staggering around, not paying attention. All these other wildebeest are like, look, dude, I know she out here somewhere. I ain't about to be slipping. As a matter of fact, I'm headed that way. Now the one that's kind of just jumping around, acting like there's no impending danger. That's the one that the lioness, she grabs. And I, what she does, she waits and she watches. She waits and she watches. She waits and she watches. The devil, he waits and he watches. He waits and he watches. What is he waiting for? He's waiting for you to wear yourself down and your resistance to fall. He wants you to come up slipping. He wants you to start talking negative. He wants you to start buying into the lie of the doctor's report. But if you, come on somebody, be vigilant and keep your head up. Come on now, somebody shout, keep your head up. Not only keep your head up, but keep your mouth open with words out of your mouth declaring what thus says the Lord. He can't catch you slipping. And while you traveling and while you going through your journey, you may as well go ahead and offer up a sacrifice of praise. You may as well go ahead and praise God for what he's already done in your life. You may as well go ahead and let the devil know that you're not buying into this lie that you dying before your time, that COVID is going to kill you. Come on now, that cancer is going to kill you, that your internal organs are not going to work. You got to keep your head up, man, and you got to keep giving God praise, because as long as the devil can keep you from honoring and worshiping God, he is trying to cause you um, to slip into what I call spiritual apathy. You know you're supposed to be working out, but you refuse to work out because it takes discipline discipline to do this. If I don't do this every day, I'm going right back to the place that God delivered me from. Somebody shout amen. It's a disciplined lifestyle. It's a lifestyle that we have to work over and over and over. You cannot beat the devil with your head down and your eyes closed. I don't mean your spirit physical eyes. I mean your spiritual eyes. Come on, somebody. I don't mean your natural head. You got to keep your head up, man. You got to keep your head on the swivel when you're dealing with the devil. The Bible says that you got to be vigilant. You got to stay awake. You can't be slipping. You can't let one day go by without quoting the word of God. Well, Pastor, I'm not going through anything right now. Remember, guys, faith is a lifestyle. It's not about right now. It's about what could happen tomorrow. Y'all not hearing me. I say it's not about right now. When I hit 50 years old, the last thing I thought was I would be dealing with a cancer battle. 50 years old, the prime of my life. I'm telling you, man, all was going well. Everything was clicking. Everything, as the young folks say, was popping. Things was working over here. People were happy over there. And boom, here come cancer. Oh, my God, what am I going to do? I thank God that I was prepared for that. Was it emotional? Yes, it was very emotional. It's so emotional. You know, that the doctors and your oncologists, they tell you that you may want to consult with a psychiatrist. They, res they, they, they inform you in your pre, you know, um, chemo treatment meeting that you may want to go ahead and get you a psychologist because this thing is going to mess with your mind. My response was, I've already consulted with the psychologist. I already consulted with a maker. I know what my results are going to Gonna look like. I'm not finna lay up on nobody's couch and tell them how bad this is. Now, if you can want to do that, you go ahead. But God was my, he was my wisdom. Come on now, he was my spiritual advisor. And I had already consulted with him for 20 something years. And he and I had
had a relationship and I knew how to hear from him and I knew how to get him on the scene of my life. You may need that and that's all fine. But at the end of the day, you got to get with God and you got to let God be your counselor, your mighty God, your prince of peace. That's who he is. All right. Now go with me real quick. I got to shut this thing down. I got to shut this thing down. All right. So now um, we have to understand that God has already, you know, given us exceeded and great promises. Watch what it says in 2 Peter 1 verse number 4. 2 Peter 1 verse number 4. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. This is a powerful, liberating teaching that we must understand in order to uh, experience true freedom. True freedom. I'm truly free. You're not looking at some fake until you make an individual. I'm truly free. I'm free from what people think about me. I'm free from needing to be accepted. I'm free from all these things that attack my mental capacity. And the way I got free was I got free. You can't get free from anything until you first get free from people. Once you get free from people, you get free from everything else. Because a lot of th a lot of times we struggle with self-image and we, we struggle with acceptance and we, we struggle with all these things because people put pressure on us to be something that we are not supposed to be. I'm so glad that I am who I am. I'm so glad that I'm happy with me some me. I like the way I look. I like the way I dress. I like the way I do all what I do because if I didn't like it, then I would be dependent on somebody else to bring me a, you know, uh, what we call a substitute. And um, I don't want to be, you know, a imitator. I want to be an originator. I like me. Hey, come on, somebody. If we're going to have a party, we're going to have a party on my terms. I'm not going to compromise my integrity to get folk to like me. So watch what it says in the scripture in 1 Peter, 2 Peter 1 verse number 4, whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises that we might be partakers. We might be partakers. I'm going to close with this. We might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now watch this, y'all. I got to shut this thing down. He said we're partakers of his divine nature. What does he mean by divine nature? Number one, we have no idea what Jesus looked like. That's not Jesus over your mama's door, that little white man with that long blonde hair. That ain't Jesus. Come on, somebody shout amen. Oh, glory to God. I say that ain't Jesus. Matter of fact, we don't know what Jesus looked like. Jesus said, don't even write no depiction of me. We can look at the scripture, and the scripture give us some idea what he looked like, and I don't want to get into all that. But watch this now, because when you get to heaven, you riding there looking for Jesus, and you don't know who's going to show up and say they Jesus. Asian man may show up and say he Jesus. You don't know. But he said now, <laughs> we take on his divine nature, his his, his spiritual part of who he is. So whatever we see him doing, you know, uh, from a divinity place, we have the same ability to do so as well. So if I take on his divine nature, if I'm in his image, I myself now could look just like Jesus from a spiritual place. You're not hearing me, man. I may not ever know what he looked like in the natural. I will when I die and transition over to heaven. But right now, I don't know who Jesus looked like. He might look like me. You might get to heaven and look up and say, Ed, I thought that was you. That'd be Jesus. You don't know. We don't know what he looked like. I'm not trying to figure out what he looked like from a natural place. I need to know what he looked like from a spiritual place. I take on his divine nature. What is his divine nature? The things that the, the apostles saw him do. We have right now on the inside of us through the Holy Spirit the ability to do the same thing. I got to stop y'all. We can lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. We can speak the mountains and the mountains will move. You're not hearing me. Things that are dead in your life, we have the ability to raise stuff from the dead. Why? Because we take on the divine nature of Jesus. We don't know what he looks like in the natural, but we know what he looks like in the spirit. He went about doing good, healing all that was sick and oppressed press of the devil. I had a member who came to my church. Gwen, she's on here. Gwen, Gwen is not the member. I had another member who came to my church. I believe Gwen brought her to the church and she was having some mental situations. She was having some situations mentally. You heard me talk about her the other day. She, she was taking 25 pills when she came to our church. Not for her health, but for her mind. 25 
pills. This lady was on 25 pills every single day of her life. She came to our church four years ago, and I remember the day she walked up to me and said, Pastor, I'm tired of these pills. I said, baby, you just stay here long enough. We're going to get you off them pills. And she sat there, and some Sundays I had no idea if she was there mentally or if she wasn't there, but she was there. Oh, my God. I say she was there, and she may not have been responsive with by worshiping her, lifting up a hand, but in the spirit realm, the word was penetrating her mental capacity. Y'all not hearing me. And every Sunday that she came, we was putting new medicine in her. She was getting new pills put in her. The pill of health. Come on now, the pill of prosperity. The pill of healing. We was putting Matthew in her and Mark in her and Luke in her and John in her. And she was showing up every day, taking that word every Sunday. And man, I'm telling you, we start seeing how her mental capacity begin to be stronger and stronger and stronger. And boy, now here we are four years later. She's not on 25 pills. She's not on 20 pills. She's not on 15 pills. She's not on 10 pills. She's not on five pills. She's on three pills. Come on, somebody. Oh, the Lord took her from 25 pills to three pills. And now she's walking in God's favor. She got a house to live in, grocery in her refrigerator. Refrigerator. God will heal and deliver and set free of your man, Pastor Ed. I'm out of here.